Okay, uh, try again. Test, test. Okay. Working? Yes. All right. So, uh, going forward, this is going to be a double session, as I said. Uh, it is divided, we've tried to divide it into two different parts. So, first part is uh, a session that, is, that I've already done uh, several times. Uh, some of you may have already seen it. I just did it uh, in, in Jumal Day, Netherlands, a few weeks back. Uh, it is. I've tried to divide the two the two sessions into like different levels. So the first one is really uh, be beginner to intermediate. Uh, so it's not for uh, it's not really for coders or uh, developers. Uh, I don't know how many how many coders we have here or developers. Quite a few. Okay, and uh, the second part. Uh, would be presented by me and Marion together, and uh, this is much more advanced. It goes in much more detail about uh, server stuff, so uh, it would be more interesting for those of you that know uh, server stuff like PHP, Apache, and uh, maybe might be less interesting for uh, those of you that don't. So. Uh, I really want to uh, make this more like a workshop than uh, uh, just plain presentation. So, uh, uh, in regards to questions, just stop me anytime and ask me rather than waiting for the end. So, I uh, would uh, let's do it more like a discussion than just present me out here presenting. So, uh, a little bit about us. Uh, as I told you, I'm Tenko. I've been the CEO of SiteGround for the past eight years or something. Uh, and uh, I, what I do uh, is I, I take care of the websites that we host, basically, and uh, trying to make our clients happy. And uh, we host more than 80,000 Joomla's, so I'm pretty familiar, familiar with Joomla on the hosting side. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also married, happily married. I have a great kid. I'm really passionate about photography as a hobby. And uh, I like uh, very much everything fast, including fast cars and fast servers, fast running websites. Fast food, not, not as much, but uh, yeah, McDonald's is fine. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, Marion here, stand up for everybody to see. Oops, that's gonna be. Oh yeah, that would be nice. Okay, so uh, I started uh, as a system administrator in '96. Uh, since then, uh, uh, I have uh, worked on a lot of uh, projects, and uh, I think in uh, 2006 or seven, I joined SiteGround. And uh, after a few years there, we decided that uh, the software we develop for SiteGround should be uh, available to more companies. So we both started uh, One Edge. And uh, away from work, uh, I'm teaching in Sofia University uh, in network security and Linux system administration. And also, I'm organizing the biggest uh, open source conference in Bulgaria, OpenFest, with more than 1,000 visitors each year. So I'm a big open source fan, <laughs> and this is why I'm here. Uh, and Maria here is also the biggest geek in our company. Uh, he would do things like automate his car, like to, uh, to have internet access and to be able to do stuff that normal cars won't be able to do. I'm, I'm thinking that he's making his car drive by, by itself now. Uh, going forward, is this okay now? Uh, not everybody cares about performance of websites nowadays. Uh, usually the, the people that care about performance are the very geeky people, like the sysadmins or the coders. And uh, they're usually the people that are used to tweak their software to, be, to squeeze the maximum performance out of it. And um, also, people that care about performance are the people that are obliged to care, like people that get a lot of traffic, like a million hit a month Joomla website would obviously care more about performance that for, uh, compared to a small Joomla website owner that only get, gets a few uh, hits a day. 
Uh, also, people that, that care about performance are, are multiple website owners, uh, the ones that, for example, have a dedicated server and need to host more websites on one server. And uh, in order to save money, it, it is obvious that you care about performance, so you make your websites load faster and then you can put more of those on the same server. Uh, if you ask me, everyone should care about performance. Uh, reasons are pretty obvious, like performance affects your Google ranking nowadays, so Google will, will measure how much time your site needs to load, and if it's, if it's slow, then it will rank you, uh, worse, uh, rank you worse than uh, if it's fast. So uh, it, it's also proven that uh, fast loading websites uh, keep their reader, readers and buyers happier because uh, 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 people would expect a website to load instantly rather than to wait for it for like seven, eight seconds. And you might lose your visitors if your site is loading slow. Uh, also, on a side note, uh, what happens if, you, if your site gets listed somewhere? Like, for example, you have a, a, a site full of information and you get listed at CNN.com and suddenly you, you get tons of traffic and uh, your site is not able to, to cope with it and it's down. So it's, it's a one-time event that you get a lot of traffic and at that one time, the peak of your website, you're down. This is completely stupid. So if you, if you don't care about performance before that happens, then this is a bi big risk you're taking. And of course, if, you're, if your site is optimized, you will save from servers and stuff, be more echo. Uh, so I've just prepared a video here, uh, which I'll try to show you uh, what I mean by performance. The right side here, uh, I've recorded uh, a simple uh, Joomla website with uh, uh, some modules on it. And uh, it, it is performance optimized. And this one here is completely the same website, but no optimization done. So below is a timer which will show you how fast they load. So the right one is done. And right now the left one is done. So one second to 4.22 seconds. You might not think that four seconds is a lot, but compare those two, it's four times of a difference. So, uh, and it's, you've, you've all experienced that. You've all like loaded websites that you click, it loads, it's super smooth, and I'm sure that all of you like it. And you've all experienced the, the other thing, like for example, Facebook, when it lags. You click and you wait and nothing happens. So before we do anything, it's always the basics. So if you are using Joomla, I would strongly suggest that you update to the latest version of your branch and if possible to the latest version that is out there. I know it's not possible for everyone, but still, the latest version is always good. Uh, people from, uh, from the Joomla, Joomla dev team, they're really up on the performance side, so they will fix a lot of stuff that, that are going on and uh, it is always wise to have the latest version. Uh, you should also uh, choose your extensions wisely. Uh, something that I would personally recommend is whenever choosing an extension, download it first, install it on your website, and before activating it, measure how much time your website needs to load. After activating it, measure again. If, if the, the loading time goes up, then there's something seriously wrong with that extension and you might want to rethink, if, yeah. How do you measure correctly? Uh, there are a lot of ways doing that. Uh, the simplest way I know of is a Firefox plugin which would tell you exactly how much time you needed to render the page. Of course, you have to clear the cache every time before you measure. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the plugin? Firebug does it by default, but it's, much, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, this one, 
why slow? You can also use GC metrics for the Google Insight tool or what you know to do Yes. I was using Giza for information in Windows 12. What is that? I was using the Giza for information in Windows 12 and Time 14. I don't think so. The Joomla information is just about the internal loading speeds of the Joomla. Yeah, so it will tell you how much time did it needed for like the MySQL query to execute and to get the results, but it won't won't tell you how much time you needed to render the whole page. So you you what you're looking for is more like the complete result rather than just taking the result from from the query from MySQL. Is that? Yeah, the browser the browser time would always be the larger portion. So it, it's better to measure by the browser via a browser plugin, whatever that may be. There are tons of those, like why slow uh, or Google Page Speed. Yeah, but uh, it's o it's always better to measure the, the end result. Uh, you might you might use the development mode or the de whatever it's called, the one that you mentioned to to see which plugin is taking most time. So you might want to deactivate those. And it's always wise to know which plugins are generating what load on your website. So that's a good thing to know too. Anyone else? I see this is a hot topic. Um, if you have extensions that you're not using, you'd better deactivate those. Because uh, if, if they stay activated, they might eat up resources and one other thing is uh, w I think we're all already past the days that uh, all websites were really colorful and uh, rich in content everywhere right now uh, what is modern and uh, is perceived as something very good is a minimalistic design that uh, that is really fast to load and that is easy to watch too so if you can uh, if you can keep with that, that would make your website load faster, and uh, it's something good. Uh, of course, not all websites can afford to do that. There, is a, there are those websites that need to be very rich in content and colors and everything. So uh, it might not apply to everybody, but if you can keep up with that, that that's a good thing. Uh, it is nice to have a very rich in content front page as well, but is it good for your load times? Not really. So uh, my personal recommendation is always not to put everything you can think of on the front page. So for example, you don't, you don't need 100% uh, of the time a weather module on your front page. Or uh, uh, you, you should ask yourself, do I need a Twitter feed on my home page? or uh, uh, do I need a Facebook feed? Uh, everything that you load from, from an external source on your homepage is, is taking its time. It's making an API call or uh, it's connecting to somewhere. So it's taking its time and uh, one thing leads to another. It, it, it goes like from a two seconds or three seconds page load. If you, if you do a lot of external stuff on your homepage, it might need to a 15 second thing. So uh, you should really consider what you put, uh, put on your, on your home page. Uh, use fewer external sources as possible. So the less is better. Of course, this might not be feasible for, 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 for everyone here, but uh, you should really consider it. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, Google Fonts is better to be used from Google, and uh, uh, like libraries you can use from outside too. But uh, I was more referring to uh, like modules that would need external resources, like uh, weather is a good example. So, for example, you use an 
AccuWeather or whatever weather plugin, it would connect every time the, the home page is refreshed or the page is put, it, put to it's refreshed, it would connect to a remote server and it would wait for some response. So let's say the, uh, the connection between your server and the remote server is slow for some reason or the remote server is down or a firewall is in place, whatever the reason, this will eventually end up in your home page like circling and not loading because of this connection being down or slow. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they do. So uh, that's why I say it's not a 100% thing, but uh, you should try to avoid it when it's not 100% necessary. Yeah, cash would help, but I uh, will go into that, you know, a little bit later. Yeah, so caching results always helps yeah, because when caching results, you're actually using local resources <coughs> rather than connecting remotely. So my recommendation is to not connect remotely if you can to and use local resources as much as you can. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so we'll start by some really simple uh, Joomla optimizations that are done on the Joomla application level. And for most of those, you don't need to do anything. It's right there. Uh, the Joomla people have put it right there. So you just need to log into your Joomla administration panel and do it. So first thing is to enable compression. Uh, do you know what uh, GZIP compression is? Yeah, do it, does, is there anybody that doesn't know? So I go into it. So you know what zipping, zipping content is? Like if, when you have a text file, you can zip it and it becomes like one tenth of the size. Uh, GZIP that does the same. So the web server gets, gets the content, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript. And because it's text, basically, it compresses it and sends it into a compressed manner to the browser. And this way, it's much, much less in size. So it's a tenth of the size. And uh, first, it saves bandwidth, which is not like something very expensive nowadays. But the most, most important part is uh, 10 kilobytes would be sent to the browser much, much faster than 100 kilobytes. So it would need 10 times less the time. Uh, so whenever you can, enable GZIP compression. And here is how you can do it. So you just log in to your Joomla, uh, navigate to site global configuration server and at the bottom there is gzip page compression just click yes you yep say whenever you can is there any reason that you shouldn't yeah uh, you shouldn't know but uh, there is a reason that you might can't like for example your host server doesn't support gzip compression that's rare nowadays isn't it i've seen that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, should we name HDXS file to .htaccess how does that work? The JZIP compression? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry, can you repeat that once? Yeah. You know, the htaccess.txt, you yeah. should rename it to .htaccess. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I've always do that like one of the first things I do, so I, I haven't noticed it. Didn't yeah. yeah. I did the same presentation uh, yeah. uh, a couple of months ago, and while testing, I forgot to, to rename the htaccess file. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. Thank you. I'll put that in <laughs> into the slide. Yep. Is it possible that some templates don't work with uh, GZIP? Like GZIP doesn't change anything on your code. It's just zips, and the browser unzips. It's that simple. So, no, it it won't change anything on the code of your website. It won't change the the way it performs. It, uh, the way it performs, it will change, but it it won't change the like what you see. Yep. Uh, it is, GZIP is the last thing the server does before sending you the result. Okay. So if you cache, it's before the GZIP. Okay. It depends on the caching mechanism, okay? Uh, well, well, it depends, uh, like reverse proxies would be the last after GZIP, but we're not talking about that yet. 
Yeah. So here we're talking about um, PAT being a profession. Um, how does that compare to using mod replacement in Apache for this application? Mod deflate is basically the GZIP module for Apache 2. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas what you're describing here is getting PAT to be a profession for you. So is it really a profession? No. It's still Apache doing it. Right. It's always Apache doing it. And this this one just says do it. How, how, yes, I, I, I know what is, I can remember how they call it, but in the HTS files, mm -hmm. thanks to Linux, there is nothing that is conditional to this setting to, to this compressor. So I, I can't understand how you're like telling uh, the HTS file that should use or should not use compressor. I think there is a add deflate option. Sorry, APX says there's nothing to do with that. Yeah, yeah. So so this is PHP compressor. compressor. What it does is that when you hit all this, um, at the end of the rendering, you want to call the PHP function. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that in turn is actually a C library that we're yeah. calling. So it's a PHP C library, it's meant to be a patch, isn't it? Uh, uh, it's actually that's calling. It's <coughs> no, 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 there is ways to do it. But it's done in C. It's not like PHP is no. just doing yeah. a compression. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's not it. Uh, PHP never does the compression. Yeah. What if you already uh, configured the server to do uh, the G ship for you? Um, w would it be double yet? Or no. It, it, the serv if, even if the server is enabled to do g the GZIP, it won't if this is disabled. Um, well, I will. I use nginx and I figured it over there. Should I <coughs> put it here, yeah? So you should uh, get yeah, okay. you should. So it would work without enabling it? Yes. Are you sure about that? Yeah, we can probably test yeah. it. We can, we can, if we have the time, we're, we're prepared to do some like live tests before you. So we can, this might be one of the things that we try. We, we have Nginx set up, so, yep. Even if you enable it, it doesn't compress everything. You still have uh, component, uh, text uh, component modules which aren't compressed. With GZIP? Yeah. Aren't they? Like with his his here is the, the line. Add output by filter deflate. Yes. This one, the second one. Yeah. So this one goes to HC access and says what to, what to compress, what not. So yeah. No, you never compress twice. So that's that's not what what happens. I mean, they if if they overlap a bit, that's okay. If there are different parts that they compress, that's okay as well. So the end result will always be lower, like the lower in kilobytes that you send. Yeah, the, the kilobytes will be lower. Yeah. Every time it's doing that compression. No, it. You're compressing like a hundred kilobytes a file on a Xeon or a double Xeon processor. You know how much time does it need? It depends on the, on the site. Whatever the site, it's it's usually it's small files that you compress. Yeah, like much faster than the network time you need to send them. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I tell you to change it. Uh, uh, let's. What I propose. So my point is, if yeah. you enable here, yeah. And you add the HP access. Mm -hmm. Well, we could 
to save some time for the compression thing, only enabling it in the HD access file. So we only compress once. And You're not compressing two times anyway. This is getting confusing to me as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I I think I think let's let's go forward and let's leave this open. So uh, if we have the time to, like, and if if we don't have the time, I'm okay with gathering around somewhere and just doing it, because okay. I'm in really interested in getting that answer as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, just to uh, enable compression, GSM compression on both uh, the HTML level, but also all the CSS files, uh, all the JavaScript files, mm -hmm. but by accident also all the zip files. And that gives a nice little problem that actually you can apply GZIP compression on a zip file which is compressed to mm -hmm. the mechanism. Um, that's gonna, gonna probably be slow. In well, it's, that's slow and it's stupid. Yeah. It, uh, there is no reason for it not to work. It's just stupid. I mean, <laughs> it, proves, it proves also a point, and that is actually that uh, most of these browsers they don't have the problem of uh, decompressing uh, a zip file. Mm -hmm. It's actually compressed with uh, GZIP. Yep. Uh, and, it and even it could be compressed with GZIP twice or thrice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't matter actually whether, whether I don't think I don't think any browser would do that though. Like I don't think all, every single browser would be able to no, like I, I do. Think it, what you could do is just take a text file, mm -hmm. uh, gzip it, so then you get text dot gzip. Mm -hmm. gzip. Then if you run gzip on it manually from the command line again, it denies it because it has a dot gzip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then that file is still handled properly by the by, by browser. The browser is smart enough to, to keep on continuing until the, the uh, uh, except in Max Explorer, but still it's it's a stupid ID. This yeah. is working only if the file is dot gzip. If yeah. the file is dot txt or dot html, the browser would want to uh, uncompress it only once. And the next thing you will see is a gibberish from the gzip. <laughs> so, uh, this happens only because the file is actually .gzip and uh, the browser is uh, uh, smart enough to know that this extension should be used with uh, uh, gzip as a whole and uh, it knows to uncompress it. Okay, and, and that proves the point actually that gzip content should be gzip only once. Yes. All right, going forward. <laughs> we spent quite a, quite a few time on the gzip. <laughs> yeah. Next time we might consider doing one. Uh, so uh, it might be wise to enable the Joomla cache, depending on, on your needs. Uh, a Joomla cache is easily enabled. You just go to, uh, go to the plugins, type in cache. You'll see system cache. You need to enable that one. And then go to site global configuration system cache settings, and here's I don't know if, if you're able to see it. I've put some uh, some basic settings. So uh, uh, if you if you're not sure what you're doing or uh, or you just want it enabled without uh, a way of breaking things, you should enable conservative caching. Uh, Joomla has that other caching type. I don't know how many are familiar with it. With it, it's called progressive. Yeah, uh, which is a bit awkward because it would cache different stuff for different users, uh, which might not be the most like intelligent thing to do. Like for example, if you have the same page for every user, it would be stupid to cache it differently for every single one of them. 
because uh, it's it's like the same content, but you cache it like if you had a had hundred users, you'll cache it a hundred times. So it will eat resources rather than serve for a purpose. So uh, I've I've listed here the options that I've used most commonly. So it's a uh, uh, conservative caching enabled, cache time 15 minutes, that should be enough for pretty much everybody. If your site doesn't get changed that much often, you can put like 60 minutes in. Uh, it's better to cache in the, the database rather than in files. So you should put database in, you save and you're done. It's pretty easy and uh, decreases the load time. So uh, here is the one that we've talked about something that you could do uh, on an HT access level to, to make your website load faster. So what expires here, so we already talked about this one, that's for the gzip. I'm not going to, to go into that anymore. Uh, uh, what expires does, those expires tag, it, it's, it's saying to the browser that if you've already downloaded this content, please get it from the local cache rather than uh, getting it from me again, from the web server. Uh, and this is good because uh, if you don't change some uh, like images on your website very often, then you don't need people to download those images every time they visit your website. Say you have a very cool website and I'm going to that website every day. I don't need to download all the images every day. Like, well, you change them once a month, so once a week re-downloading them should be enough. And this is what, what, what I've done here. Um, what more can you do? Of course, the usual stuff uh, includes uh, resizing your images to be able to fit a website and not to be like a uh, proper size for photoshopping. Uh, uh, it is common that I see p our clients upload images like 2560 to 1600 and uh, this is very uh, difficult for a web browser to render it is slow it takes time and it's just not good yep in 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 any case uh, uh, I would generate a thumbnail. Sorry? In any case, I would generate a thumbnail, and for the general public, I will show the smaller image, and I will link to the bigger image. So whoever wants to get that bigger image, be able to click it, get it on whatever display he likes to. Uh, uh, this is more of a design question, but what our designers at SiteGround do is they're usually uh, using elements that would repeat for such displays. No, no, but it's a picture. So you need to show one big picture? Yeah, yeah. Is that it? Ah, uh, well, then you sacrifice the loading time and show the one, one big picture. <laughs> Ah, that's ugly. No, you can actually make it quite interesting uh, this way, and uh, you will save a lot of uh, bandwidth uh, and a lot of time from the picture because you can you're choosing the only a few uh, colors. You no, you can. Uh, uh, for example, I don't know if you use Photoshop, uh, but yeah, for, in Photoshop you can reduce the quality, which will reduce the size greatly. But but like in in visual stylish, it it would not change the image as much. Yeah, I, I usually use like twenty or thirty percent. Yeah, and uh, do you do safe for web? Yeah. yeah. So that's the best thing you can do. You can you can do like smush it, which would do basically the same, or. Uh, uh, there are like other software that would do the same, but there is not much you can do if you want to show the bigger image. Yeah, it is. Uh, I was referring more to uh, like people to avoid uploading big images 
uh, when they don't need those, but when you need it, there's so much you can do. Um, it is always good to use sprites. How many of you are using sprites now? Quite a few. The rest of you should be using sprites. You know what sprites is? Anybody that doesn't know? Okay. Uh, it is, for example, you have 10 images on one page, like the Google home page, although you don't see it, it has a lot of images, it has like the next button, the previous next, like small arrows. It is aligning and putting those all, all of those images into one big image, and rather than uh, uh, big, uh, vertical, horizontal, whatever it is, uh, putting uh, all of those into one, and then displaying just the part of that image to uh, where where it should should be. So, for example, uh, just displaying top left on in the center of the website. Yeah, yeah, just via CSS. So uh, this way, you uh, you don't make like ten connections to the to the web server each time you need to get those ten images. You just make one connection and get all of them, and then via CSS say which part is displayed where. But how do you do, how do, you do that? Uh, use a sprite? Is that like... A uh, there is, uh, in Joomla you can do it pretty easily with uh, extensions. Okay. I'm just going to be showing that okay. in a bit. Uh, yeah, we talked about this. So this is, this one, the first one is a very good extension that we've tried and our clients are using, which would generate spr sprites automatically. I've, I, I've actually, uh, I've just listed some extensions here that do uh, this kind of stuff, yeah. Which? Strip merge? Script merge? Is that it? Uh, let me write this down. You've used it and you're happy? Yeah, I used it and I'm pretty happy with it. Who created that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Let's <laughs> <laughs> make a point about um, combining JavaScript files, which can cause chaos on websites. Because if there's one tiny error in one of the JavaScript files, then most of the JavaScript then becomes inoperable on that page. That is true. So a lot of the CSS combining tools sometimes merge the files in the wrong order, and then that again can result, result in a bad result laziness in the wrong order. Yes, exactly, exactly. So they can cause yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things that I'm going at the end of the first session, that every time you enable something new, I advise to go and retest everything that you've done on your website, because it a lot of times it would cause a lot of trouble, but in the end, the result is worth it. So I've said it earlier. Uh, yep. Um, these are really nice tools, but the problem with it is that these are plug -in system plug -in. Uh huh. There is a way to do it manually. I'll show you just right now. Uh, is this? Yeah, this is how to enable the JCH optimized plugin. I think uh, we'll just skip that. These are just some options that our clients use them that we've recommended to them for that particular plugin. If you're interested, you can download my slides later. Look at look through it. I'm not going to to be uh, using much time here on this slide. So this is uh, like a server way to do it, like using the Google Apache PageSpeed module. Uh, I don't know how many of you have used it, but I see very a lot of questions now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, um, alpha, alpha yeah, it will be better for some time. Yeah. So what page speed does is obviously Google are concerned with website performance nowadays, and what page speed does is it would automatically compress and combine and add some caches, and uh, it it will replace the need of need of uh, putting up a plugin or an extension to your Joomla, but. Uh, on the contra contrary, it needs to be installed on your server 
rather than on your web hosting account. So if you're not root on the server, that might be a little bit problematic or if your web host doesn't have it. Uh, but from, from what we've tested, Google PageSpeed performs very well and it can be widely tuned so that it caches more and more stuff. So uh, it, it would really serve your needs. Yep. Can it be tuned to act different on a shared hosting environment on different per website? Yeah. Uh, for, for example, on our servers, we have it, we have it on all of our servers, yeah. so like shared, dedicated, and uh, we've, we've put it in so that every hosting account can use it. But every hosting account has its own configuration, which can be altered by the user. So if you, because if you go down and read its manual, it's pretty big. So it has a lot of options. Uh, we've put in some options that we believe are good for everybody. But then again, you can go and do whatever you want to. Yeah, uh, personally, I think because with our hosting, it's just it's just an icon, Google PageSpeed, and you go and say enable. And I think it's much easier to do that than go install plugins and worry about everything else. And from my experience, it, uh, for on, on your question, it, it fucks up less with everything. <laughs> I'm sorry for the term, but it does. Like, it works better, uh, but uh, you can do it both ways. Yeah, it, uh, the sprites, yes. uh, it, it's at Gzips combines CSS, JavaScript, but that's basically it. And HTML. And what? Uh, HTML compression. Yeah. Bas basically that's it, but it's more than enough. And uh, it's, yeah, it is. You don't want to enable things twice, so what to disable when you enable this one? So you should disable any plugin that generates sprites. You should disable any plugins that, that would uh, like compress and combine uh, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML files. And uh, that's basically it. But, but it's still a good idea to keep on your own basic cache if you do that. Yeah. On, I, on this. Yeah. I don't think a reason not to. Um, and a thing that we've saw by enabling this plugin. Uh, Google has the, the, that service PageSpeed for Insights. I don't know, probably some of you have used it. And it has a grade. It shows a grade of your website. So it, the grade might be from A to F. Enabling Google PageSpeed always brings up your grade. So w which, which it, is, it is something that you, you'd expect, right? Uh, it is, uh, so Google, Google now, thinks your website is more worth ranking higher when, you ha when you're using their plugin. Um, here, is, here is three links that we use uh, to, to check how our website performance is, is going. First is the one that I just told you about, Google PageSpeed Insights. Uh, YSlow is another one and GTmetrics is another one. Uh, YSlow and Google PageSpeed also have uh, Chrome and uh, uh, Firefox plugins. So you could launch them directly to, from the browser for any, web, any website, any web page, and you can get directly the results. Uh, this is something that you, you might want to do because it shows very uh, neat information, like which resources need what time to load and uh, uh, what, what you need to do to further optimize your web page. So if you haven't used any of those, please do. And if you have, please continue to do so. So here is a test that we've done, a basic test. This is a default Joomla. Uh, the first line is uh, time needed for the page load. This is, as discussed previously, this is the time as rendered by the browser. Uh, as you can see, the Joomla needed 1.61 seconds with uh, no optimization whatsoever. The cache drops it down to 1.49. Then the HT access rules drops it to 1.32, and then the JCH drops it to 1.02. So this is like 60% of a difference, 55% of a difference. But the big difference comes here, like 563 kilobytes in the default Joomla, and just 151 in the all compression enabled. 
that's a huge difference in size. Like in, rem, imagine you're in, uh, in a position where you're browsing uh, from somewhere with slow internet connections, say in the Netherlands on a uh, <laughs> conference center, and those four, 400 kilobytes would make much, much of a difference, like a minute of a difference in load time. So uh, the other important aspect, of course, is the number of HTTP requests, which dropped down from 35 to 19. So your, gener your users would be generating much less uh, of an impact to your server than if no caching is enabled. And of course, you're getting the good grade from Google. There are some server level optimizations that, yeah? Um, you don't have a slide with uh, the comparison to the normal unoptimized Joomla site, and then the optimized version with the site ground tick box of Google PageSpeed enabled. Uh, I think it would be great to, to add that. Uh, no, we don't have that one. We have one with other server level optimizations that we do. Yeah. Yeah. But we can probably do that. As well, I think I'm thinking we're running a little bit late, but uh, yeah, we'll try to catch up. So uh, on the server level stuff, it's good to use CDN. How many of you are using CDN now? Quite a few. That's good. What type of CDN are you using? Amazon. Is that isn't that a little bit expensive? If I can afford it, yes. Yeah. Max? Max. Max again. Activated my own domain. Mm -hmm. I pointed to the same uh, folder as my Joomla. Mm -hmm. And I use that CDN. It's on the same server as it has the app from the page speed, but not with a real CDN. You know, it's not a real CDN when you're serving from the same spot. <laughs> it depends where your visitors come from. It depends. Yeah. But it's only one location. From only one, one location <laughs> would be. <laughs> Yeah, Cloudflare is a good choice, good free choice. Encapsula is a good free choice as well. Uh, Rackspace, uh, there is a spade as well. Uh, the, the biggest problem with like Amazon or Max CDN is that you'll, you need to like install a, a plugin or an extension to make it work. And uh, it's usually more expensive. So that's the biggest problem. It's not really a problem, more than you need to do stuff. With Cloudflare, you just enable, it's free, you enable, and it works. Yeah, as a plus, it has security like WAF, a web application firewall. So it will protect from, uh, I don't know if you heard a few weeks back, there was a massive attack towards Joomla and WordPress sites, like brute force attack. Uh, it will help for things like that. Yep. What is CDN? Uh? CDN is a content delivery network. Uh, what a CDN would do is it will download images, CSS, JavaScript, and HTML files off your website, and it will disperse them across the world. So uh, whenever a visitor visits your website, that, uh, that those static files, they will be downloaded from a location that's ne nearest to him rather than from your, where, where your server resides. So let's say uh, your, your, your server is in Miami and your visitor is in Sydney. It's always better to download the, the, big, the big files, like the images, from a location that's near him because that would be much faster. With, with the Cloudflare, no. The Cloudflare type of CDN, you don't need to do anything. You just sign up for an, for an account. Uh, you uh, Actually, you do need to do something. You sign up for an account. You enable the account. Then you say what the, your website is. Then you need to pu pu point your domain towards the CDN because that's how it works. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do. And uh, that's it. No, it is not necessary. But it's it's 
if the, if the CDM provider has a pop, it is still wise because it also saves you server resources. Like uh, those hits, they're not going to your web server, they're going to the CDN instead. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that, uh, I just mentioned it, uh, the CDN will avoid unneeded I.O. on your hard drives of your servers, which is a good thing, and will always appeal to search engines like Google. So uh, if, you, if you've used uh, uh, Google PageSpeed for insights, uh, it's, it, it gives, by default, it gives every website a great F for not using a CDN simply because it, it can't really understand if your website is using a CDN or not. But if you click on a button and say, hey, I'm using a CDN, it will rank you A immediately, which is stupid. But still, it implies that Google will, would like you to use CDN. Uh, here is something, something completely different. Uh, this is more on the server side caching now. So this, this is where the things get uh, more complicated and might be not really well suitable for, for the beginners. Uh, how many of you have, have used object caching or opcode? Just you? Yeah. Okay. Just a few. Okay, we'll try to we'll try to go into details in th into this one. So the one of the fastest way to run PHP on a server is called fast CGI. Uh, it is uh, it is good to have APC installed as well. APC is an opcode caching mechanism. Uh, this is all done on, on, on a server level, of course, so you either need your host to do it or you need a root and the and a sys a sysadmin skills to do it. So uh, another, thing, another thing that is pretty good is to have memcached to store results uh, from uh, PHP queries to the MySQL, uh, which, however, and I'm really sad to say this, doesn't really improve the performance of a Joomla website. Uh, we've been talking to some of the uh, people that are on the dev team of Joomla to improve the memcache compati compatibility with Joomla. Now, uh, now, right now, it's not really doing anything to improve performance, as you will see. And another way to uh, to to cache uh, to cache like opcode cache is eAccelerator, which which is something like APC, only different. Uh, so I'll just show how it works. So basically what, what happens uh, when somebody visits a Joomla website is, so say this is the user, this is your website, and this is your database server, MySQL, Postgre, SQL, whatever works for you. So the user generates a request that then goes to the Joomla, and um, that request requires some data from the database. The Joomla query is the database. Uh, the database result, uh, returns the result to Joomla and Joomla returns the result to the visitor. This is how it usually works. Uh, what if you have uh, a memcached server um, and, and opcode caching? This is how it changes. So uh, the, uh, the, the, all the requests will go the same way, but the results, when returned to the user, they will also be stored in the cache. So next time the same request is made, no database request will be done. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, and here is how opcode actually works. Here is how PHP actually works in the first place. So PHP, Joomla is written in PHP. So whenever uh, you execute whatever page, like your index page, it, it goes to PHP, which, which goes through all of those processes before executing your page and delivering, delivering your result. The result. So it goes to, through lex, uh, scanning, lexing, parsing, compilation, and opcode. And then execution, which returns you the HTML code. So if you have opcode enabled, like APC, here is what happens. We cut off like six steps. And this is much, much faster in reality like 
times faster. I have a slide with uh, a lot of results in a minute. I just need to show you one more thing and we'll go to that. Another, the last thing I'm going to show you before uh, five minutes rest is uh, the, the one and only thing that you can do on your website and make it super fast and be able to uh, like conquer thousands of visitors at the same time is to add a reverse proxy server such as somebody mentioned Nginx. Nginx is such a server. Varnish is such a server as well. Uh, so uh, what is a reverse proxy server? Well, sometimes you get a lot of visitors. Sometimes you do. I really want you, all of you to get a lot of visitors. That's a nice thing. But uh, your website, your web server is not always happy to get all those visitors. At some moment, it would uh, uh, start loading very slowly. And at, at some, some moment, it might even crash. So what a reverse proxy server does is it would uh, stay in front of your web server or be your web server and it would cache automatically the contents of your website and return everything from the cache from the memory very very fast without doing anything any PHP without doing any SQL queries it will just store plain HTML files and return those to the user yeah Uh, from time to time, the cache is cleared, and then the, the proxy server always queries the, say, Apache, or whatever your web server is. So then this request is slower, and it's better to have all of those done, so that request is fast. Other than that, not so much. Yeah, gzip is a mandatory, other than that, not so much. Uh, for our shared clients, we have our own implementation of our uh, of a, a reverse proxy server that we use. We call it the super cacher. And uh, it is really easy to use. It's an on-off button and it's able to handle quite a load of traffic. And uh, the limit there be then becomes the, the bandwidth that you have rather than because with a normal like Apache server, you can get something like 200, 300 uh, simultaneous connections to the server. With, with a proxy server, it's thousands, thousands and thousands, but I'll show you in a minute. Yep? Invalidating cache is the biggest problem. Uh, like, say you have a page with comments. Like, you have a beautiful article and you have thousands of people commenting on it. Uh, if you cache that page, uh, people would uh, see the page, would see some of the comments, but would not be able to see most of the new comments that have come in because they're seeing a cached page. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, the tricky part is to make it, to make the cache flush every time there is a new thing on the page. Uh, we have, with our imp implementation, that's why I'm saying we have our own implementation. With our implementation, we have a plugin for Joomla that would uh, flush the cache every time something on the page has changed. So that's how it's working. Uh, if you are using Varnish, for example, or Nginx, you can say uh, via its configuration file that you don't want to cache this page specifically, which we'll uh, show in the second session, I think, for Varnish, yeah. Uh, but it's tricky. This is the tricky part, yeah. And what about session-specific content? Uh, what is that? The session specific. How do you handle session-specific content? Uh, this is for you more. Yes. 
I think so. Like by configuration in the control panel of SiteGround? Uh, well, we're doing it by VCOs, right? Yeah. Uh, so the, the, uh, it has those files that would say what to cache and what not to cache. For example, the, the administrator part, you don't want to cache that because most probably you have... Obviously, it's dynamic every time. Yeah. So that's, that's the text file, you just put yeah. the URLs in it? Uh, also it's the option for HTTPS to exclude uh, HTTPS? Do we do that? I, I don't think we, we, uh, we either cache uh, SSL pages at all. Yeah. Like it's always delivered from Apache rather than from the proxy. Anybody else? All right, we're good to go. So what basically it does it, as I said, so it, it will deliver uh, pages from the cache from the RAM of the server. Uh, and uh, yeah, we already talked about that. Here is, here is the results. So uh, this time we've used a different Joomla. So it's not a default Joomla anymore. Uh, this is a Joomla with Virtumart. As you might know, might or might not know, Virtumart is not really the best plugin concerning resor resources on the server. So uh, this is why we've chosen it. Uh, and uh, it, it has only a few products, but still the default loading time goes to 5.22 seconds. And with, with all, like the reverse proxy enabled and CDN enabled, it goes down to just one second. So this is, it, it really makes an impact. Uh, it, uh, especially if you're, if you're having a big website and especially if you're having tremendous amount of users. It really makes an impact. And uh, as you can see, the, the grade gets A as well, which always make Google happy. And uh, some key takes from part one are uh, optimization is a process. You should do it regularly. And uh, I would advise against doing it on a live site because uh, it can cause troubles. Even if you know what you're doing, which our staff, for example, knows what they're doing and they're often messing with, with something just because they forgot something or something gone uh, to uh, something unexpected happens. So use a staging environment, like use a second copy of your, of your website when testing. And uh, you should choose a host that has all of this good goodies enabled. Because if you have a host that doesn't have gzip, that's pretty bad. And there are some of those. So um, would you like a five minute break? Okay, just just five minutes though because we're yeah. over time and uh, so it's, thanks. Yes, we got a Аз мисля, че добре става въпреки всичко. Хората са яко инволвд. Независимо колко са тако. Should I stop it now? No, I don't know how to hold the... I'll just...
So hey everybody, I have unmuted it. Is it okay? Hey! <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, since we're going to be uh, doing this with Marian together and we need to share a microphone, this might look a little bit awkward because I'll have to lean towards him. I'm sorry about that in advance. Uh, in this presentation, we'll try to go into more detail. So uh, first, usually the people that would go into more detail are the ones that would choose their own hardware. So how many of you cho cho are choosing their own hardware? A few? All right. Then this is a question to you then. Is it a cloud or a VPS or a dedicated server? Dedicated? Why dedicated? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I missed the question. <laughs> <laughs> Cloud, VPS, or dedicated? Well, all three. All three? That's the correct answer if you ask me. So it all depends. Uh, uh, Cloud, uh, Cloud is uh, a modern term. It is usually a VPS, a highly scalable VPS, what Cloud is. And uh, it, it might be super fast, it might be super slow, depending, depending on your needs and depending on your budget. So uh, Amazon themselves are uh, selling the I.O. operations of their cloud platform as a separate. So if you want your Amazon cloud to perform very well, you need to buy IOPS from them, which is rather expensive. So uh, you can get a cloud, but uh, then that's only if you need uh, like a scalable solution. VPS, if you ask me, is a quite good solution because it's still scalable up to the limit of the host node uh, free space. So say uh, the host node is able to, to host like 128 gigs of RAM so and has 64 of those available, your VPS can scale up to 64 gigs of RAM, which is more than en enough, basically. Dedicated is usually expensive, however, resources are, are all yours, and uh, it is usually not scalable at all. So if you need to scale it up, you either add another dedicated and cluster it, or you shut it down, you'll be offline for like an hour or so, you add more RAM, you add a second processor or whatever you do, and then, then put it back up, and this is scaling. So it all depends on your needs, and uh, what, uh, what I'm going to show you right now, it's regardless of the platform, it's always true. So I would recommend t for you to use SSD for MySQL, because it's times faster than a normal spinning hard drive, and it's proven to be much more efficient, especially for MySQL operation and for cache. Uh, Marian here, uh, he told me to uh, add that second line, that SSD uh, capable fi file system is much better uh, than uh, regular file system uh, for dealing with that kind of stuff, if, if you can explain a little bit more about that. That would, mic sharing would be a little bit stupid. Uh, the problem is that normal file systems are not optimized at all uh, for uh, sh uh, for ordering the information on SSD drives. They are uh, optimized for ordering the information on normal spinning drives, so uh, usually they are buffering a lot of information before they start writing it. Uh, the problem is that seek time, the actual moving of the heads uh, to the proper part of the hard drive is the slowest part uh, of uh, the, the slowest section of uh, the hard drives. With SSDs you uh, don't have this uh, seek time at all because uh, you always know when you, uh, where, where you want to write anything. So at that point uh, most modern file systems they're not working uh, for the hard drive, with the hard drive, while if you choose uh, uh, SSD-capable uh, file system, like, uh, for example, which 
In, in Linux we have uh, four different uh, file systems, maybe uh, L2FS or uh, I don't remember all of them. Uh, if someone wants, I can check and I'll tell you which, uh, which are the ones. Uh, the, they are optimized to write uh, on these SSD drives and also optimized to, um, okay, to minimize the actual, uh, overhead. not overhead, but every time you write on SSD drive, uh, every memory s cell in the SSD drive has lifetime. So you ha uh, your and file system. Okay. Just okay. ask him afterwards if you're interested. I, I thought it's something that the geeky guys would be interested in. That's why I put it here. So uh, it's always better to have RAID for your files and RAID for caching as well. The SSD capable file systems are 10, 50% faster than uh, normal file systems for SSD drives. <laughs> okay. This, this was the key part. <laughs> That that was what I I was sold on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, use write for files and RAM for caching. RAM is cheaper nowadays, so the more the better. Obviously, uh, I would advise for having CPUs that support virtualization, because uh, it's really uh, difficult to make to make your software scale, but it's easier if you can split that software into different, like, like virtual machines and make it work there. So that would be difficult without a CPU that supports virtu virtualization. And the last part, it's not really hardware related, although it's good to have a separate hardware backup, like backup on a different different physical machine. Always have a backup. Uh, that's a mandatory thing. Uh, here's what we're going to be doing now. Uh, we'll need a web server. We need a, an SQL server. We need a PHP with cache. We need memcached. And we need static and a reverse proxy server. So here is the first question for you. Apache or Nginx? Anyone on this one? Yep. I, I prefer NGX myself, mm -hmm. but uh, if you share those uh, environments, uh, it's difficult because you have, don't have HP access, so your users can't uh, override configuration. That is true. So I've put some pros and cons for both of it. So Apache is really easy to set up. It, uh, it supports Joomla out of the box. It has mod rewrite, so what you just said is isn't true for Apache. Apache would work with uh, like HC access and stuff. It can be nine. It can be found on like 99.9% point of the web hosts. It's free. Uh, it's there. It would be probably be supported by the web host because it's a software that's been there for for a while and everybody knows it. It comes with. Uh, it has a lot of extensions, so it can be extended pretty good. On the on the cons side, though, it doesn't it doesn't scale as well, and uh, it uh, it is very resource heavy compared to Nginx. So it needs much more RAM, much more CPU, and uh, it it can only handle so much uh, uh, number of concurrent users. So the larger your website goes grows, uh, the the more the more you will see the need to get rid of Apache, basically. And uh, it's generally slower. Uh, for those of you that are running their own Apache, we have uh, some recommended settings here. And again, I'll have Marion explain those. First of all, the default timeout that you see uh, here, the first option, uh, is usually around 90 seconds, which means that uh, you keep uh, this request within one process for at least 90 seconds. So uh, decreasing this time will actually free the process uh, faster. If you're, you have a Joomla extension that uh, is uh, written uh, very poorly uh, and it takes a lot of time to actually produce any output from the PHP, uh, what happens here is uh, that uh, you're taking a lot of resources from the server every time 90 seconds and more. Uh, you would want to 
notify the customer in any way that uh, uh, this is not a proper website. 90 seconds to load a page, <laughs> not, a, not something that you would want to have. So 30 seconds, I believe, is uh, something normal for uh, the internet at the moment. You would not wait more than 30 seconds to see a page, anything. Uh, the other is uh, keep a lifetime out. Uh, there is a difference between uh, normal connections and keep a life connections. In HTTP, you can set, uh, say to the web server that this is a keep a life connection, so the browser will reuse this connection to request a second, third, and more uh, uh, objects for your website. For example, you firstly uh, get the HTML, but then you would request uh, CSS files, image files. You can uh, reuse this connection and uh, the second timeout is uh, simply the time between the first request and the subsequent request. So uh, it doesn't need to be so uh, large. 10 seconds between uh, the HTML and uh, the CSS, I believe, is more than enough. Uh, I have seen applications that require more. This is the actual option that you need to... Uh, that you need to change. The last option from the first three is uh, maximum keep a live request that you would want to keep in Apache. So uh, if you have already 30 uh, requests, the 31st would not be allowed to be uh, keep a live requests. Well, why is that? Because uh, if you you know that Apache spawns child's different processes. Uh, every keep a live connection has its own child. So this means that you have 30 childs dedicated to these connections and uh, you don't want to uh, get all of your child process of Apache uh, used with uh, 200 connections, for example, or 250 connections, which is the normal limit for uh, clients per Apache. You would want to have some of them if you have free resources. So this is how you configure you configure the timeout here and the uh, number of processes for keep alive. So you could have a middle point between uh, every request uh, uh, short lived or uh, long lived requests with keep alive. The next thing is uh, server configuration. Uh, this is something that you would have to test on your machines. Uh, it's not something that. Uh, I would recommend for everyone. I, these numbers are not generic and they cannot be. Your, uh, your site may be uh, more with more visitors or with less visitors. I will try to explain what this means. Start server says that uh, Apache should start at least uh, 20 uh, child processes when you restart or start the uh, Apache web server at the beginning. This means that uh, if you have uh, more visitors, you would have at least 20 processes that will uh, immediately start uh, serving content. Uh, the next thing is uh, the minimum spare servers that Apache would leave. Uh, this means that if you have for example, 10 of these 20 uh, processors are already uh, busy with uh, serving some content from, uh, for the users. Uh, Apache would see that and will try to spawn, for example, five more. This means that you never leave Apache uh, with less than 10 uh, free processes to serve content. The next thing is max spare servers. This means that uh, you, would want, uh, you wouldn't want to create a lot of processes because each Apache child is actually taking memory and uh, it's sometimes like 30 megabytes and 30 megabytes per child uh, times uh, 100 is something that you wouldn't want to have on your machine working uh, without actually using it. This is why uh, you should configure the max spare servers to something that is sensible to your setup, to your VPS or dedicated server. And finally, uh, one very important part, Apache comes with a lot of modules, a lot, and each of these modules is uh, adding time to processing the request and also adding uh, a memory for each child. So remove all the modules that you don't need. Uh, you can uh, achieve like 10% uh, better performance only by doing this. And if you uh, have a, a site with many visitors, what will happen is that uh, you decrease the memory usage of your machine uh, drastically. Thanks. I'll just see.
called that as well. Uh, so, our second option was Nginx. So, Nginx has, Nginx has a lot of pros compared to Apache. First of all, and major of all, is speed. Uh, but, uh, so its server response time is always lower. It's much faster. It has very high number of concurrent users that it can handle, which is a good thing. Uh, it is faster than Apache in serving static content. It also supports fast CGI, which is a good method, good fast method of running PHP. On the contrary, though, as a cons, uh, you can say that Nginx is not supported by everybody, so not all web hosts have it. Uh, you'd probably need a dedicated box. Uh, it's not supported by major control panels as well. So if you're used to using cPanel and it's not supported, can't have it on cPanel. Uh, and it, uh, on the worst side, it does not support mode rewrite. So if you're used to that, it does not support it. You can make Joomla work with Nginx, search engine friendly URLs. Here's how you can do it. This is the configuration part that you need. Here's where you can get it from so that you don't write it down. It's actually from the wiki of Joomla. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think Nicholas has done that and he's put it on, on the wiki of Joomla. Not really sure. He told me so. Yep. doesn't support HT access motor write rules. Yeah. You can rewrite uh, anything in the engines, but it doesn't support the rules that Apache supports. So Apache supports a great deal. Yes. Yeah. It's a big it's a big problem basically because right now it's done for Joomla because somebody else has done it. But uh, let's say you you want to use some custom software that's built for Apache and all the directives that it, okay. yeah, makes a problem. Uh, there are some online tools to uh, confirm uh, HT access scripts. Uh, I mean, the, the rules to uh, Nginx. Or yeah, there, those are helpful, but they're not 100% bulletproof. Yeah, we've tried some of those. We've even tried to create one of our own that would convert everything from Apache to Nginx, but it won't work 100% of the time. Yeah. Uh, here is uh, how a configuration file should look like uh, if you're trying to install fast CGI for Nginx. <laughs> this one is for you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just be, sh be sure don't we don't have enough time. Okay, uh, this, when you start uh, fast CGI, you have to have a script that is actually executing the PHP for you. So this is uh, the, P uh, the script that we are using. And uh, this is uh, if you want to make it so like uh, SueExec, uh, the same way that SueExec does it for Apache, you can change the user, uh, the user ID and execute it uh, for this user. Uh, it's not a problem. And this, the, mm, these two are the different part. This means that you're spawning 20 childs for this process, uh, and each child may uh, process maximum 5,000 requests. After 5,000 requests, it will die, and uh, the first, uh, the main process will start a new child. This is why fast CGI uh, you see uh, is not 100% uh, uh, available all the time. Uh, so, just in theory, how FastCGI works, FastCGI spawns a number of processes, and uh, those processes, those are PHPs running, constantly running, and waiting for somebody to connect to them and tell them what to do. So, uh, in, in regards of how PHP usually works, is the web server gets the connection and then launches the PHP, which then starts doing what it's doing, which is much, much slower than what FastCGI have done with a constantly running process. So this uh, decreases the time of load because uh, the, the binary, the PHP binary is already loaded into the memory, the server memory, and uh, it decreases the time needed to, to like start up. So FastCGI is good, basically. Um, we've also put some MySQL tips here. Uh, uh, this is also for Marion because it's getting a little bit more technical than I can explain. Uh, okay, so, so 
Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, MySQL you know, usually uh, have buffers for uh, a lot of the query information. When you connect to each uh, to MySQL, you're dedicated. You have a dedicated thread in MySQL to execute something. And for this connection, uh, you get uh, a lot of uh, memory allocated only for you for your connection. At that point. At that point, uh, what's happening is uh, that you get at least 5 or 10 megabytes per connection. So if you get a lot of connections to MySQL, uh, you get a lot of memory usage. This uh, memory, uh, most of the time, is not uh, allocated uh, as expected. Uh, you're not using it right. So uh, what you have to see is... Uh, check out the buffers in uh, MySQL configuration and uh, keep in mind that uh, only the key buffer is uh, shared between threads and every other buffer is a uh, simple pointer which means it's an integer, it's a number. So uh, if it's a number and uh, it has to collect numbers and not the actual data, uh, you don't need to rise it more than megabyte usually. Uh, even megabyte is quite big number for collecting num uh, numbers. Uh, so decrease the buffers, join buffers, uh, uh, read buffers, write buffers, they are per connection, decrease them. Also, uh, Jumo is using IONDB. IONDB is a good engine, but uh, you have to optimize it uh, quite well the, uh, in order to uh, use it uh, better. You. You have to separate the data files. The data usually in uh, UNDB is in a single file. So the I.O. is centralized around a single file. This is problematic when uh, you want to separate your IOPS uh, between different hard drives, which is impossible when you have one file. <laughs> so you can, uh, what you can do is separate the uh, f data files the data in different files with an option called InnoDB file per table. And uh, with this option, each table, only the data of the table will be stored in different file in the database directory in MySQL for uh, each database. And also, you have to increase the thread concurrency. When you have more cores, and this is the usual case nowadays, uh, you would want to have more threads uh, concurrently working on this data. So uh, what I'm proposing is if you don't have more than 16 cores, uh, make the uh, thread concurrency equal to the number of cores. Usually MySQL, normal Oracle MySQL scales well up to eight concurrent uh, threads. Uh, if you're using uh, Percona or MariaDB, and I advise you to switch to those, uh, is uh, you can scale up to 16 to 20 uh, concurrent threads uh, without uh, losing performance. And uh, what the final part is query cache. Uh, most of the people simply don't understand the query cache at all for MySQL. Uh, most of the time it doesn't uh, uh, cache uh, what you're thinking. So uh, first of all you have to see if you really uh, are using the query cache. Uh, you, you can select this information from uh, the database. Directly uh, MySQL sta uh, show status. Uh, is the command show status is the query and in this query you see these uh, options the query cache hits means that uh, this is the number of times you are actually getting information from the query cache uh, inserts how many times you are inserting and this option here if you see her uh, see it more than zero this is a big problem for you. This means that every time that it is increased, the whole query has been cleared because you didn't have enough memory to push w whatever you wanted in the query cache. Uh, this is what you see uh, when uh, it's uh, well optimized to your system. You see that small number of queries are not in the cache. These will never be cached. And uh, the next thing is how many queries that uh, you have in the cache. Uh, I think it's for you again. Okay. So the next thing is fast CGI setup. Okay. One yep. There is, a, uh, there is a script run, which is a MySQL fusion script. Yes. Uh, 
It is from uh, Peter Zaitsev. Uh, he's uh, from Percona. Uh, he was one of the chief uh, optim okay, optimizers of uh, MySQL uh, when it was uh, uh, when he was in MySQL. He currently has his own company, Percona, and he is doing a lot of uh, optimization. He runs the MySQL performance block. Read that block. They have quite a few, uh, quite good, interesting articles there. Okay. Uh, keep in mind that query cache has to be uh, changed, reconfigured at least a day, every day, because uh, your uh, workload is changing constantly. So the queries that hit uh, this cache are changing constantly. This means that uh, at certain point, what you have configured is not what you want. So if you're using this script, uh, use it with uh, use it every day. Okay. So the next part is how to configure fast CGI and APC. Uh, so this is Apache. Uh, this is the Apache configuration, and uh, this is what you would uh, have in a normal uh, vhost uh, in uh, Apache. You say that for all PHP files, you would set uh, FCGI handler, and this is a wrapper script. This, the script is to here, and the .php is simple, uh, simply the extensions that would be sent to this uh, wrapper script. And this is how the wrapper script looks like. It's uh, similar to the one that we are uh, using for Nginx. Uh, simply, we are missing the part with uh, uh, the su switching to the user, because Apache does this for us with uh, both su exec. So uh, the setup here is uh, similar. The thing that is different is uh, the maximum request length. This means that if the size of the request is more than this one, it would not reach the uh, fast CGI handler. Uh, the other options are the same like for Nginx. And uh, APC, you already uh, understood what APC is, right? Uh, it's an opcode cache, and opcodes are simple. Uh, take it like uh, assembler instructions that you send to uh, you send to to the CPU. So uh, APC you can install pretty easily on the server, and uh, you have to add in uh, your PHP file this one extension equal APC uh, dot so. Uh, this is not the right place uh, on your server. PHP may be somewhere else. So uh, you find it pretty easy with PHP info or uh, dash i. Yes? Uh, Peko and uh, peer are simple scripts that point to the PHP binary. So uh, you either have them or write, uh, write them yourself. It's pretty easy. <laughs> there are five lines. So <laughs> There are scripts. Uh, yes, uh, peer is uh, usually the package that provides you with uh, uh, Peko and peer uh, scripts. What you would have also, uh, if you, you don't have packages, uh, when you are installing from source, they are uh, installed uh, by default if you don't disable them. OK, uh, next one is memcached. Memcached is a daemon that is uh, allocating memory and uh, giving you access to this memory through uh, TCP IP socket or uh, Unix domain socket. This means that you get access directly to memory and you can access this memory from different uh, processes and uh, it gives you protocol for this. Uh, you can install in uh, CentOS and Fedora with Yum on uh, Debian and uh, Ubuntu with apt-get install memcached. Uh, you also need the memcache extension. There are two extensions for memcache, uh, memcache and memcached. Uh, I get better performance with memcache. Uh, some of my friends get, uh, get better performance with memcached. Uh, so uh, you have to check what suits you better. I advise you to use memcache, but it's your own decision. Uh, they differ only in configuration. 
So this is how you run your uh, memcache server. Uh, here I am saying that uh, I want only 64 megs uh, of RAM allocated for this uh, memcache daemon. And here I am saying that uh, I want 2000 uh, uh, concurrent connections to be handled by uh, memcache. Uh, then I add uh, pid file so I know that uh, this is uh, the memcache that I want. Usually memcache is running for TCP IP on uh, this port 11 to 11 uh, but in this setup I have uh, set it up to use use the main socket if you are not using memcached for cluster, sh uh, cluster environment you don't need TCP sockets they uh, add a lot of overhead like uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent overhead for each uh, uh, packet that you're sending for all the data that you're uh, communicating with uh, a part, uh, with memcached and the biggest issue of, uh, of all is that uh, when you're communicating this you're not uh, uh, you're also routed so you have to do IP routing on your local machine which even though it's faster, it's something that you would uh, you wouldn't want to have on your machine. Uh, yes, uh, if the memcache is not on the same machine, obviously you have to connect through network. So TCP/IP is the only way that you can connect it. Uh, there are ways with shared file systems to get a Unix domain socket between uh, different machines, but this is far too advanced. <laughs> Okay, uh, the next part is uh, how to enable memcache and uh, APC in Joomla because if you install them for PHP this doesn't mean that Joomla at all uses this. So uh, here uh, in the cache settings uh, you have a drop down menu for the caching uh, and you down uh, below it you have a session handler uh, caching. Normally you use, use database for uh, sessions if you move the, uh, the sessions in memcache, you can simply have two servers, two physical servers, different locations that can uh, synchronize via the, uh, via the memcache and have the sessions, one session available at both servers. This doesn't mean that uh, you would have the database, the MySQL database on both servers. This is something that you have to uh, think for. But f at least for the sessions, Memcache provides you with a very easy way to uh, make them available to multiple machines. And, uh, just to pick you up here, in order to, to make Joomla detect the Memcache, you need to run it on the standard port. Other than if it's not run on the standard port, Joom Joomla will not, will not pick it up. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm going to push a patch that will remove this limitation because uh, uh, there are quite a few companies that run multiple instances of memcache and with each uh, instance of memcache uh, you have to allocate a new port and new port and if uh, Joomla don't detect it, <laughs> it's a stupid. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, one final thing about uh, memcache is that uh, when you're using it, uh, at least with uh, Joomla, uh, currently there is no easy way to uh, use uh, Unix domain socket. Again, I'll try to patch this and push it. Uh, I already patched it. <laughs> uh, I'll try to uh, push the patch to the GitHub repository. So uh, in this file, you can simply uh, comment uh, this uh, these actual lines and replace them with these and uh, what will happen is that you always connect directly to uh, the Unix domain socket and this is the path to, uh, to the file. So uh, the next thing is move your PHP binaries to RAM. How to do this? Use uh, TMPFS. It's a file system used for uh, that creates allocates memory and creates a file system in the memory. So uh, every time you reboot your machine you have to copy everything to the RAM but uh, other than that uh, you get a very big performance of uh, loading all the files from the RAM not uh, from your hard drive. This means that you don't get uh, as bottleneck on your machine when you're executing the actual PHP binary. Uh, and if possible 
move your Juma installation also in the RAM, if it is possible for your case. This means that uh, you never use the hard drive anymore. And, uh, okay, you use it, for example, for mm, images if you leave them on the hard drive, but if you move everything to the RAM, you never use your hard drive unless you are rebooting. This uh, speeds up your everything on your machine. And uh, when you get a, uh, hit by thousands of uh, requests, uh, this saves your machine from crashing. Uh, also, uh, move MySQL to SSD drive or uh, RAID. Uh, again, uh, I remember the file systems LogFS or uh, NewFS are the two that uh, perform better on SSDs, at least on uh, Linux. If you're a FreeBSD fan, uh, they also have a uh, uh, type of LogFS for their, uh, their operating system. Uh, enable MySQL query cache because uh, most of the times uh, default setups for Oracle MySQL, which comes by default with uh, CentOS and Fedora, uh, they don't have query cache enabled. Uh, also use uh, TMPFS uh, for uh, temporary tables. A lot of queries that are uh, big for MySQL, MySQL automatically optim uh, optimize them to, uh, s uh, to create a temporary table. Each temporary table is usually created in slash TMP, but you can define the directory and change this directory to be TMPFS. This would mean that you will not use the hard drive, but you will use the memory for creating uh, temporary tables. Don't ask why they don't do it directly in MySQL. <laughs> uh, mod page speed. Uh, optimizes a lot of things, as uh, Tenku said, so uh, using it with uh, Apache and uh, Nginx is a very good idea. And uh, gzip uh, compression is something uh, that is kind of a pitfall, uh, because if you configure it wrongly, uh, you may serve... Uh, I have seen Jumo sites that uh, use uh, search engine optimization that uses uh, .html uh, for the URLs, and someone decided to configure his Apache to uh, serve .html files with uh, mod gzip. What happened is that uh, instead of opening the actual file, they were simply gzip. So <laughs> it was misconfiguration that is pretty easy to do. Test it after you're changing something on Apache. The next thing is uh, use reverse proxy. Reverse proxies are uh, very nice, as uh, Tenko said. We are proposing to use uh, Varnish uh, because it's easy to set up, but uh, keep in mind that it's only available for uh, normal HTTP connections. This means that uh, HTTPS connections cannot be handled by Varnish. Uh, one other thing for it, uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, what you get is uh, uh, from uh, 400 requests, you can reach uh, 183,000. Uh, yeah, we have a slide. Yeah. Uh, it's free open source software. It pre it's pretty easy to set up, and the limitation usually is not CPU, it's uh, network connectivity. It's pretty easy to. Uh, Fill one gigabit, pretty easy. Uh, we haven't tried with two gigabits, but one gigabit we filled with <laughs> with a simple program that benchmarks the network. Uh, the problem uh, with varnish is that you usually uh, install it, but you don't have so many options to uh, configure. You have uh, configuration file that uh, defines different stages of requests. And uh, it's harder to understand Varnish than Nginx or Apache because most people simply don't understand the uh, actual process of uh, requesting a page in the servers. So uh, it has a, a bit of a warning curve for the beginning, but after that it's pretty easy to add new things, change uh, how it works. Uh, also, uh, with, with Varnish or any uh, other reverse proxy, you still need web server to serve your data. It's not a web server. It's a proxy server, so it caches only. And uh, also, uh, you need, obviously, PHP. Uh, 
I don't know why this is uh, a con here because dramatic performance <laughs> increase. <laughs> Only when caching them dynamic content. Um, okay, varnish caches ev uh, can cache everything, but uh, obviously we have pages in Joomla admin uh, admin area uh, login area and uh, URLs that if cached. You cannot log in, you cannot change anything. This is why uh, performance uh, without this, without caching the dynamic content is not so good. Uh, caching dynamic content is the tricky part as uh, we saw. Uh, you can configure different parts or you can say, for example, you can make Joomla say to the varnish uh, that uh, it has changed something. Every time a content is updated, uh, a comment is added, a new article is added, a menu is changed, uh, you can configure, you can write a Joomla extension that uh, will tell the varnish that uh, something has changed and which part of uh, the cached site has to be cleared. Uh, this is what we do uh, in... Uh, yeah, this is something that... Uh, it's not very easy to do, but uh, it's not also very hard. It's in the middle. Uh, Non-cacheable pages for Joomla, at least what uh, we have identified for it is uh, the installation folder, administration, and registration form. Uh, by registration form, I'm also implying that this is the login form. Uh, and the next thing is uh, you have to set up uh, expiration times with uh, mod expires for Apache or expires in uh, uh, Nginx. So every, everything that you push to the varnish, varnish knows how often it has to check it from the actual Apache server. Uh, if you don't set it up, uh, you get default uh, time, uh, which may be too much for your setup. Uh, this is... Uh, standard uh, configuration for a varnish that you can use. Uh, our magic is done in this file. <laughs> and th the rest is uh, how to skip administrator, installation, registration. And here we, we have skipped the information for login. Uh, this uh, tells varnish that these extensions should be woke up directly from the cache. This means that at this point you will not uh, uh, request these files directly from uh, Apache. Last two okay. Uh, uh, so we've done some tests. We're almost over. We've done some tests to illustrate how how all, all those caching affects your Joomla website. Uh, all of our tests are performed on a on a VPS, pretty common VPS. Uh, this is one of the most common that we sell. That's what, why we used it. It's not something super powerful. It's a four-core VPS, four gigs of RAM. It runs on a on a RAID array, so uh, RAID a array below it. Uh, for the for the s purpose of uh, for the sake of test, we used a software called Siege. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It what it does it it's it's blasting a num big number of connections towards the website, and we're measuring the time that it needs to be done. Uh, he, uh, here is the comment, the exact comment that we're using uh, in the urls.txt file. Uh, we have some URLs of a Joomla website that we'll, we're going to be using. And uh, those are predefined. And we no measure the number of hits a Joomla website can take for 60 seconds. So here is the result. So a normal Apache with fast CGI would take 3,200 hits for 60 seconds. And uh, an Apache with fast CGI and Nginx would take 185,000 hits. That's quite a difference. And Varnish, Varnish and, uh, and Nginx results are pretty similar. Like you can see Nginx is on top here with some like something like 7,000 results, which seems like a lot, but out of 200,000, it's not that much in percentage. Uh, you can see this, however. 
the only setup that availability was 100%. Availability means that every time you, you request uh, a, a page is returned rather than a blank page or an internal server error or an error of any kind, the only setup that it was 100% was with, with the reverse proxy setup. Because uh, it is common that when you blast a lot of connections towards a web server, it would start returning errors at some point. Is yeah, confusing. and uh, what, what is more impressive is, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but Apache was able to return 9 megabytes of data for 60 seconds, and for example, Nginx was able to return 519 megabytes of data. That's a huge difference. So Nginx pretty much get, gets limited by your network, so we filled, it, filled its network card here, so that's, that's the limit your machine can handle. And the, the best thing is the response time goes down from like 0 0.3 seconds to 0 0.01 seconds. And the best thing is your machine doesn't feel it. It's like zero load whatsoever. So uh, I think we have to be finishing now because we're past due. Thank you, everybody. And uh, hope to see you soon. Uh, I don't know.